So I'm going to talk just briefly about the transport of the ECMO patient. Um, at the next Con Ed, we'll go into a little bit more of like the medical management of it, but this is kind of just a general overview and kind of like the bits and pieces and how it all goes together and what you need to particularly pay attention to during transport. Um, objectives, discuss the difference between VV and VA ECMO, discuss the roles of the transport team, discuss how to prepare for an ECMO transport, and then we're going to discuss about management of adverse events that you could see during transport. There we go. All right, so first VA ECMO. VA ECMO is both respiratory and hemodynamic support. So this is your patient that not only isn't breathing well, they're not perfusing well. So it'll be patients that um, like e ECPR that they crash on ECMO for a witness arrest or your patient that is at heart failure um, or it could be your COVID patient that has myocarditis. So you're gonna have your venous drainage line in the sky right here. It's gonna come out, go through the oxygenator and the pump, and then go back in through your return line. Um, whether it's venous or arterial, they typically cut, they call them venous and arterial. So the venous is always your drainage, arterial is always your return line. So if you have a VV ECMO patient, they could refer to it as the arterial side, even though it's not going to an artery, it's kind of like for the nurses, like the CDBH. I don't know. All right, so VA ECMO um, cannulation sites are typically, you could do fem-fem, so you're gonna go into your femoral vein and your femoral artery. This middle one right here, I have never actually seen. It's incredibly rare. I don't know if anyone actually does this, but going from your IJ to your carotid. Your carotid is a pretty small vessel and those cannulas are super big. What? I have never seen that at shock trauma. Um, and then this other one over here is the centrally cannulated patient. That is your patient that goes for like a cabbage and they can't wean them off pump. So they already have the cannulas in so they stay centrally cannulated. And then VV ECMO is strictly providing respiratory support. It's gonna provide oxygenation and it's gonna provide CO2 removal. So it's going to have the venous drainage line and then your return line similar to the VA ECMO, except it's going from vein to vein instead of vein to artery. And then with the VV ECMO, just briefly, there's um, the Avalon cannula. So you just need the one insertion site. These are popular with the transplant patients, like one transplants that are waiting to get worked up. It'll go into your IJ and it just has separate ports. It's by cable, so it's got like two cannulas in it, kind of like the, um, the vent circuit where it's coaxial. So you can pull and push from the same site. These are really great because it allows the patient to like get up and move and do all the things that it needs to do so it doesn't decondition while it's waiting for a lung transplant. Um, so you can do fem-fem, so you'd go from a femoral vein to another femoral vein. You can do fem-IJ, which is pretty common. So you'd be pulling from your fem and going back into your IJ. Okay, so briefly the transport team members, this is based, it's basically our crew. You've got a nurse, an EMT, a medic, and you're adding a perfusionist. Um, for most of these transports, it'll be a Hopkins perfusionist, but um, it could also be a perfusionist from the sending team. So it, if it's a Hopkins perfusionist, you're gonna be working with the cardio help. If it's not a Hopkins perfusionist, you might be working with a rotaflow or a different type of machine. And then with VA ECMO, Sometimes they'll send a cardiac surgeon. They don't always. Um, I've never done one with a cardiac surgeon. Honestly, there's not much that they can do um, that the perfusionist can't do. And to clarify, that's not like bar that's perfusion requirement. Yeah, that's not us. Yeah, it's not, it's not that we think we need them. All right. Yeah, there, there's... In my professional opinion, there is nothing a cardiac surgeon is going to do that we can't do. It's shit hits the fan. So now with the new system, there's no cannulation that has to take place in the setting. What can't? Anyone recanalize? 
So you never have to recannulate, you just switch the ECMO circuit. Yeah. That's yeah. There's no ECMO go team for Hopkins. It's not like university where they will send out a cardiac surgeon to cannulate the patient. We're, we don't have like, we're not. But a couple of them, I'm saying early on, a couple of them, we ran the surgeon to actually cut the cannulas. Oh no, perfusion does that. Perfusion yeah. Does that. Perfusion does that. Does that. Okay. Yeah. It should, it should do that. I think that is one of those reasons why you should prefer to have a cardiac surgeon with them at times in case something goes wrong in the whole process. Got it. But yeah. You, you said something about the cardio health. If they are on a cardio health at the sending and we have the cardio health, then yeah, it makes it super easy. It's you just pop. pop. It's right. plug and play. Uh, but if it's not that, you know, not, not everybody, not, it's always not, it's not always going to be that simple or easy. Yeah. So, um, if a lot of places use rotaflows, flows, and then if you do, do that, then the perfusion is going to have to switch over. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, yeah. exactly. <laughs> and uh, and it's, it's, their, it's their rule that for VA ECMO, uh, a, a restriction comes in. Yeah. Um, we, you know, we will roll the punches and whatever. But currently, it's their, their deal. Uh, okay. So, all the equipment that you need um, you need your pack rack, you need two full oxygen bottles. You're going to definitely want to make sure you have a hand crank. Um, you'll need two clamps. And we'll get into those. You're going to need those in your emergency situations. Yes. Two portables to be able to move the patient from bedside to the ambulance. You would probably want to have your mains pretty full too. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Yeah. But no, this is just for like the movement of the patient to the ambulance and movement of the patient out of the ambulance. You need the two oxygen models. Um, and that's because you need one, one for the ECMO. One, one for the one vent. vent, yeah. If the patient's vented. So it's not that they're going to Most of them are. I mean, they might be trucking through a lot of oxygen. It depends on just their status. But you need the two because you have two, like, two sources. Yeah. yeah. All right. So hand cranking, basically what happens, so say there is a total power failure of the ECMO circuit. It completely shuts down, so the pump isn't working anymore. What this is doing is this is taking the place of the pump. So it's kind of like, like churning butter. Like you're 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 the power source now. So and we'll go over this like in the in the breakout section of how you actually do that. Um, typically, your perfusionist is going to do this. They're very territorial people. They like their stuff. They like people to not touch it. Um, but if your perfusionist is on the floor, then you you need to at least have a general idea of how to do it. So this is gonna be like a complete powder failure. Um, and we'll go over exactly what you do in the hands-on portion. So these videos, I could not get to play last time, so I'm not even gonna try. This is just shows you the hand cranking operation, which we're gonna go over in the hands-on. All right, ECMO checklist. This is basically pulled from um, our protocol or SOG. These are just the things that you need to think about before you leave to go on an ECMO call to make sure that you've crossed all your I's, you've dotted all your T's, you've got everything that you need. Um, you can call medical command before leaving base. Obviously, just because you got report from the outside hospital doesn't mean it's actually what you're gonna see when you get to the patient, just like everyone else. Um, again, the two full D cylinders, your perfusionist is gonna bring their go bag and all the supplies. Um, obviously you want your narcotics and meds just like any other transport. Um, some of these patients, especially if they're post-op cabbage patients that couldn't come off, they're still probably gonna be on a pacemaker possibly. So you might need to take your pacemaker. Um, and then these patients, if there is an emergency or sometimes they lose blood during cannulation, they tend to need blood, especially if um, they decannulate, but if they decannulate, they're pretty much dead. Um, so if you can get the facility to be able to send with you blood products in case you think you're gonna need them, um, that's one more thing to think about. And then if you are gonna take them, you wanna make sure you take a blood cooler with ice packs so they don't get too warm so you can actually give them. A lot of these patients, especially the VA ECMO patients, may still be on a balloon pump. So if they're on a balloon pump, make sure you take all your balloon pump supplies. These patients will also a lot of times be on an impella. Um, the cool thing about the impella, why they leave them on the impella is it offloads the right heart. So they could be on an impella and an ECMO just because you cannulate for VA ECMO doesn't mean the impella comes out. 
Um, you're going to need your vent and your supply if they're vented. Same thing with balloon pump. Yeah, same thing with balloon pump because it's really reducing that afterload and perfusing the coronary arteries, which your VA ECMO is not going to do. Um, so vents and supplies, if your patient is vented, most of them will be. You want to make sure you have all your pumps that you're going to need. You want to make sure you have your pack rack because that's where your ECMO console is going to sit. And then make sure inverter power is sufficient for ECMO machines. So if you're doing the cardio help, all of our ambulances are cool because they have the pseudo sine wave or is it the, the pseudo sine wave? If you're transporting with a non-Hopkins perfusionist and they're on the road to flow, it may not go very well. No, it, those work fine with the pseudo sine as well. If, if they have the, well, what, what happened with the one truck? Um, where, yeah, there was some issue with that, okay. that particular inverter. The pseudo sine will work with, with the, both, both the road to flow okay. and the cardio help. Um, but if you have a backup truck. A back, okay. Then in the, in the past, and the problem here, here separate, and I know we always took a um, air hugger because the power supply in the truck would not power the heater for the. Yeah, you probably could put that in like the, the high flow because that is that might require a pure sign. I'll yeah. probably plug that into the, the high flow dial that we've got for high flow. Okay. We haven't tried that yet since we got those installed. Like, that's my guess is that would work. Okay. Right, right. So um, I'm just going to repeat that so that people can hear. If it's if you plug an ECMO machine into something that's not pseudo sine or sine wave. It won't just not power it, it'll actually shut it'll down. It'll completely shut it down. Shut down the ECMO machine. I had that fun experience up at York Hospital. It will completely shut the circuit down. And then you'll hand No, you'll, you, it'll restart very quickly. Nope. Yes, it will. Unless you unplug it. It'll, yeah. But yeah, you have to unplug If you unplug it, it will act, it'll restart right back up. Yeah. So if that happens, unplug it. <laughs> you repeat it one more time. It's supposed to go on which one and not the which one? The high flow. No, so it, it, it can go in any of them. It's in our truck, it doesn't matter. It could go in any outlet. It's in fine. Outlet. Yes, okay. in our trucks, it's fine. Okay. Unless there's a problem with the inverter. Okay. Here, you may plug into the high flow plug. You may have to plug it in. Does that make sense to everybody? Yes. Okay. <laughs> okay. Okay. All right, so patient preparation, it's going to be very similar to almost every other transport you do with a couple little tweaks. Now you got a new piece of equipment that's giving you new numbers, and these numbers are going to be different. You want to pay attention to them. So obviously the first thing you're going to do as the transport team is you're going to go in, you're going to assess your patient. Um, you're, they're probably going to have it right on report whether they were VV or VA ECMO, but go ahead and just look at the patient and you'll be able to figure it out. And you can ask the perfusionist there and they'll be like, yep, VV ECMO or yep, VA ECMO. Um, you're gonna look at your EKG, you're gonna look at your vital signs, including end tidal, any hemodynamic monitoring. They typically do a right radial arc line in these patients. Um, and then here's where the new numbers are. And these are your ECMO numbers. So you're gonna look at your blood flow. That's gonna be in liters per minute. It's gonna be on the actual ECMO console. You're gonna look at RPMs. That's gonna tell you how fast the motor's spinning. You're going to look at your sweep, and that's going to be a flow rate. It's typically, it could be oxygen or it could be carbogen. Carbogen's like 5% CO2, like a regular oxygen tank will work fine for your sweep. And then you're going to look at your FiO2 on your ECMO oxygenator. So if your patient's vented, now you have a specific FiO2 on your oxygenator and a specific FiO2 on your ventilator. Um, if they're vented, you're going to look at their vent settings, and you're going to want to take a look at their lab values. These people are going to be heparinized. Um, you're, they could be, um, have low hemoglobins or categorates, it's, but it's like any other critical patient. You're going to look at your lab values to see if there's anything you need to do. Um, you're going to look at your cannula. You're going to make sure that they're secured. Um, if you're looking at your cannulas right next to each other, you're going to want to see a color variation because you, you're supposed to be auctioning. So if they look the same, something's gone wrong. The cannulas aren't placed right. You could be recirking, which is where it's pulling and pushing so it's not actually going to the body. It's just kind of going through the ECMO circuit instead of going out through the body. 
Um, you're going to want to look at your oxygenator and your perfusionist is going to be doing all of this too. So you're going to have multiple sets of eyes looking at these patients. Um, for the oxygenator, the main thing that you want to look for is there could be clots forming in the oxygenator. And the best way to see that is if you take a flashlight and shine it on your oxygenator, you can see if there's clots. Your perfusionist is also going to check this too. You're going to look for clots in your cannulas as well because if you have if you're starting to have a bunch of clots on your venous side, they could eventually make their way over to the arterial side and now your patient's gonna stroke out. Um, you can check the x-ray confirmation for cannula placement. They're always gonna shoot an x-ray afterwards to make sure the cannulas are in the right position, just like a central line. And then obviously make sure you have adequate IV access. Um, with the cardio help, you cannot infuse through the circuit like you can with the rotaflow. So if you need to give massive amount of blood products or fluids very quickly. You want to make sure that you have some type of to do that for it. So then you're going to update your report and then you're going to do what you always do. You're going to transfer the patient to the transport equipment, except now you've just got an extra piece of equipment. The perfusionist is going to do all of the ECMO prep work for you. So they're going to, if they're going from cardio help to cardio help, they'll just pop it off and put it back on. If it's a rotaflow to cardio help, you're going to watch them like prime the circuit, clamp the line, switch them over, and get them going. And then they're also going to assess everything that you just assessed. They're going to look at the settings, they're going to look at lab values, and they're going to make sure that the sweep, the flow rates, and everything are doing what they're supposed to be doing for the patient. All right, obviously, use caution when you're positioning or moving the patient. Uh, it's it, it's kind of like your balloon pump patient. You've got to watch that line. Um, in this one, it's even a little bit more important because if, you, if these lines come out, your patient's probably dead. Um, and you're gonna carefully monitor the cannula and insertion sites for bleeding, making sure they're staying secured. It's like checking your airway every time you move a patient. You're just keeping them safe. Um, ECMO cannula, the catheters, just be careful when you're moving them around. Um, there, you could drop um, air in through an unsecured line. Um, and for any emergency procedures, your priority is gonna to be to assist perfusion and to stabilize the patient. But obviously you wanna contact medical McMahon, not because they're gonna have some brilliant idea how to fix the patient, but they're gonna be able to talk to the receiving facility and prepare them for what's going on. They may have a brilliant idea, but they're gonna be able to get the receiving team prepared in case there is an emergency event. <clears throat> <laughs> Look your left hand straight up in the air. Like this? Yeah. <laughs> oh. <laughs> Where was I? Right there. This is the moment. This one. Okay. Decannulation. It's really, really bad. <laughs> um, so let's say you do somehow a cannula comes out. Immediately, the first thing you're going to do is they have those big old clamps up there clamp both lines. Um, it, whatever line came out, you're going to have a lot of bleeding because they're big garden hoses, especially if it's an arterial line. Um, you are going to see a sudden change in your patient, um, <laughs> obviously. <laughs> like it's, things are going to get really bad really fast. Um, depending on if they're VA or VA, it'll, VA or VV is how, how bad the situation is going to be. So what you're going to do is ECMO is no longer working. There's you can't, it's not even an option anymore. So now you have to provide all the supportive care that you can, volume expansion, you might need vasopressors. The circuits themselves hold like six to 700 cc's of volume. So they've basically lost like over a unit of blood. So they're probably gonna need some volume. If your patient um, was on what we typically call like vent rest settings or lung rest settings, you're gonna need to change those settings back to something a little more aggressive. And then again, contact medical command just so you can figure out what the plan is for this patient. And then this just kind of walks over what I was telling you earlier. So your VV patient, you pull out one of the lines, they're gonna get hypoxic, they're gonna get hypercarbic. Obviously there could be massive bleeding and they could go into cardiac arrest. Your VA, VA patient, is going to go into cardiac arrest, they are going to die, <laughs> especially if they are centrally cannulated. If one of those lines come out, they're, they're absolutely toast. There's nothing you can do. Um, so in the event of pump failure, um, the ECMO circuit and the power supply should immediately be checked, like I was talking about. If you plug it in and it shuts down, pull that thing out, restart it back up, 
if that doesn't work, then you need to be ready to rapidly initiate the hand crank. Um, and like I said, it's probably going to be the perfusionist that does that, but it's very good for us to know in case they need help, in case they're passed out on the floor. Um, and then if there's no backup hand crank, if you're not flowing through that circuit, you're making clots, clamp the lines. Pump failure, again, electrical failure, or pump head disengagement. Pump head disengages, re-engage it. Um, your perfusionists will do that. Um, and again, if the circuit is stopped for any period of time, these patients are gonna clot. It's a really large volume of blood in there and just sits back and it's gonna clot super fast, even though they, these patients are typically heparinized. If the circuit's not running, they're not, they're gonna clot pretty quick. And you clamp it, do you wanna clamp close to the machine or close to the patient? Close to the patient. As close to the patient as you can get. Um, low flow alarm. This will be something that comes up on the pump. So if there's a low flow alarm, first thing you're going to do, just like any type of pump, if you've got some type of flow alarm, you're going to check your lines, you're going to check your pump, you're going to make sure things aren't kinked, you're going to make sure things are positioned nice and well. But then if you still are not getting the flow that you need, you may need volume, you might need vasopressors. Um, depending on your hemoglobin, you could give fluids, you could give blood. Uh, another good way to tell if these patients are volume down before you even get to a low flow alarm is the line will kind of shake a little bit. It's called chugging. They almost always need volume with the line chugging or chattering. Um, if vasopressors are needed, um, typically you're gonna start with epinephrine, you're gonna titrate per protocol. But if the low flow is due to a pump failure, none of this is going to help, and you're going to have to get the hand crank out. Just out of curiosity, I see you talk about normal saline and, and blood products, but um, I know that there's certain people at Shock Trauma that absolutely hate albumin, but like what's on scan? Uh, well, I brought a patient to Shock Trauma once, and they ran me out to get it. I thought I was just asking about yeah. for our. I mean, you're not going to have it in the truck, so. I got it from somebody. Yeah, oh. I've, I've seen it sometimes I'll send it over here. So, okay. Um, I thought you still have them. I mean, under our right. They if they want to, people want to get snotty about it, let them get snotty about it. If it's the patient dead, I nope, know. cool. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. I, just, I, I don't, what if you guys have I don't know if our on. cardiothoracic team has a distinct opinion yeah. on albumin. I don't know why. It was probably just physician preference. They're all persnickety. Yeah. Karen, can you repeat what they did as we came here? Huh? Can you repeat what the discussion was? We we weren't able to hear the two I'm people. Sorry. I had asked about um, the stance of albumin. Um, I saw that we talked about giving normal saline or blood products on the screen. Um, and only because in w one experience of the several experiences of uh, transporter ECMO, that um, the accepting facility was upset that I had given albumin. And so I guess I was just asking. It's not, it's not gonna be ECMO specific why they're mad. It's gonna be their patient management preferences. Did you hear what Aaron said? Yeah. Cool. But yeah, albumin's not gonna hurt the ECMO patient. It's not gonna hurt the circuit. It's not gonna, like, it's just a persnickety physician having an idea of how they like to treat patients right. versus way someone else would want to. And obviously if we had blood, we'd be in blood anyway. Yeah. So. But I mean, you, you do the best you have with what you have. So if they need volume, albumin is a good volume expander. <laughs> Help me. <laughs> that, that only works for about 10 minutes. You, you can do the charge. I'm gonna do the leg now. All right, um, oxygen loss, just taking up oxygen with you. Like if you lose oxygen, then you, you're stuck with what you have. So that, that obviously is an adverse event. Preparation is what's gonna prevent that. Um, bleeding is common in these patients because they are given a huge slug of heparin when they're cannulated and then placed on a, uh, a heparin drip. So just, you wanna make sure that if you think they're gonna need blood, you have blood available um, and if, you're going to want to assess the surgical, which would be the centrally cannulated patients and, in, and other sites for bleeding. Yes. Um, th there's a lab 
give us the, the blood they give us the blood ops did they give us the cooler that goes in or do we have to arrange the cooler that i don't know suburban gave us the cooler but i think i feel like they probably they would standards of suspending all the supplies and containers to put the blood products in okay yeah okay bruce said it's pretty standard that you would be provided a cooler Any other questions? <laughs> Anything? Anything? You also will you'll have more opportunity to ask questions during the hands-on session. It's 45 minutes. You'll get your hands on your things and you'll probably come up with stuff then. I mean, is there any pearls that you have to like transporting us on that would be good for us to know? I think the oh, most important that. thing is your perfusionist is your best friend. Um, they, they're an excellent resource for you. This is what they do. That's what they get paid to do. It's what they went to school for. Um, and slow and steady. Um, there's no reason to rush. The patient's already cannulated. This is not a pre-ECMO patient where they're basically dying in front of you and you have to get them somewhere fast to get the procedure. They've had the procedure. They should be stabilized. So slow and steady, get them where they need to go safely. Another question I was curious about, which we're not really, we're probably, I'm not really going to have to answer, I'm sure, but it, is the requirement of having a CT surgeon there for VA, is that something that you think would ever change or? Yes. Okay. Yeah, most programs don't use a CT surgeon. Some programs yeah, don't even use a perfusionist, but um, I think just with the last time, it was one of those, it wasn't the end of the world, it was fine, and the guy was really decent about it but like he had cases the next day and we didn't get him back to midnight yeah. so it's probably not the best use of resources to tie up a, a cardiothoracic surgeon to right. sit in the front of the ambulance but it is what it is it's what right. hopkins perfusion wants so all right if there's nothing else it's time for lunch